On this episode of Skeptico, Chris Carter returns to discuss his latest book, Science and the Afterlife Experience. Are there unintended consequences for overthrowing materialism? Is there a chance that the game is going to wind up being played one way or another? It's scientific materialism or it's church rule. And someone has made the decision that I choose the phony scientific materialism over the thin, phony church state. One of the uh, major themes of my book is that there's a third alternative, one that does not require a leap of faith and one that does not require embracing the pseudoscientific ideology of materialism. There's a third alternative, and the third alternative is to examine the evidence without prejudice, without materialistic prejudice or religious prejudice, and see what the evidence says. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and on this episode of Skeptico, we welcome back Chris Carter, who you just heard in the introduction. Chris is well known to many of you listeners for his excellent books on both the skeptics, afterlife, and NDEs. He's covered a lot of the topics we cover here. I enjoyed my conversation with him. I especially enjoyed playing devil's advocate with Chris on a couple of these topics that you'll hear about. So I don't know why I always seem to tangle with Chris in these kind of unexpected ways, but maybe it makes for interesting conversation. I'll let you decide. Hey, I also wanted to give you a heads up on a Skeptico listener who sent me a link to her very interesting book, and I carried on a little email dialogue with Cynthia, and I wound up asking her to prepare this, this little promo for her book, so give a listen. Hey, Alex, this is Cynthia Clayton Parent, and I'm calling to first thank you so much for reading my book, and secondly, because you enjoyed it, for inviting me to talk briefly about it and to invite your listeners to download it for free from my website. The title is Belief is So Last Century. My thesis suggests that we must move past both the belief of the dualist and the believing skeptic and join forces as free thinkers as a way forward. As your listeners are well aware, because of the great successes of materialistic science, we have, metaphorically speaking, a big group of scientists riding high in a pimped out luxury bus speeding down the materialistic highway. And they leave dualists with loose change in their pockets on rocky roads in 60s VW vans with bumper stickers stating, woo woo does work. The fact is we must give those researchers willing to take more of a free-thinking approach on the question of consciousness survival facilities on a level of NASA and CERN. My book includes solutions to help reach this goal and a big idea for how NDE research could be better served while ending a big ongoing contested debate in this country. So while it's still free, I invite your listeners to download the book at beliefissolastcentury.org and for sharing their thoughts on your forum. And I also want to say congratulations, Alex, so much for bringing 200 great shows to us exploring the question of who the hell are we anyway. And I'll just end by saying thanks again and bye for now. So please check out Cynthia's book. I'll have a link to it in the show notes. But for now, let's move on to my interview with Chris Carter. Today we welcome Chris Carter back to Skeptico. Many of you know Chris for his withering attacks on skeptical nonsense and his books, Science and the Near-Death Experience, Science and Psychic Phenomena, and his latest, Science and the Afterlife Experience. Chris holds undergraduate and master's degrees in philosophy from Oxford. He's a very fine writer, and it's a pleasure to welcome him back to Skeptico. Chris, welcome back. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Alex. How are you doing? Great, great. Everything's good. This latest book is really fascinating. It's obviously a topic that we love to talk about here, and uh, you really dig into so much. I'm hoping we can talk about the book, but also talk about a lot of other things surrounding the book. So I'm, I'm anxious to have you back on. All right. That sounds great. So Chris, you begin the book with this. The manner in which we live our lives to a large extent depends on what we believe comes after it. Fantastic. Love it. Tell us more about that quote. Well, uh, Right above uh, what I say, that, I mention a quote by George Orwell, and it goes, The major problem of our time is decay in the belief 
impersonal immortality. And so that's what inspired um, the first paragraph of my book, um, Orwell's grim vision of the future, which was portrayed in his novel 1984, fortunately did not come to pass. However, many of us believe that mankind now faces a future even worse than anything Orwell imagined. We have population growth, we have global climate change, we have uh, increasing income inequality in various countries, including the United States. Uh, increasing environmental devastation, uh, acidification of the ocean, hostilities, growing hostilities around the world. So I think that mankind needs a new message, or perhaps an old message, by which he can um, find a more pur purposeful and less destructive way of living. You know, that's interesting, and that's certainly one way to take it. It's very interesting, actually, that you take it that way, because I actually took it in a much more positive, personal sense, and that's that in one way we struggle with these large social, cultural issues that you talked about, but in another way, it's really more of a personal journey for all of us. It's, you know, what decisions we make about the people around us, about how we care for them, about how we how we think about ourselves and our role and our life and what it means and what it means in relation to the people that have come before us, either in our family or friends who have passed away. And in that way, the manner in which we live our lives to a large extent depends on what we believe comes after it is a much more optimistic, a much more positive spin to it, doesn't it? Well, I think that yes, uh, <laughs> the belief in an afterlife most certainly does put a more optimistic spin on our lives. But I think it also makes us more aware of our obligations to each other and to future generations to not use the Earth or the Earth's atmosphere as one big garbage dump to, uh, to pay our fair share of environmental damage that we're causing by dumping 90 million tons of heat-trapping gases into the atmosphere every 24 hours through the burning of fossil fuels. And uh, on a smaller scale, I suppose, just by treating each other more humanely, um, by looking after others, uh, by voting to sustain the planet and to reduce income inequality, to make the, f the, f the richer people pay their fair share. And uh, I hate to sound like some, some sort of crazy left-wing radical. I'm not. I consider myself a moderate. But I do think that there are very dangerous forces operating in the world today which threaten the long-term viability of human civilization. You know, that's really interesting, Chris. And I didn't imagine that we'd jump right into this kind of political current events kind of discussion, but I'm really glad we did because I think it's an important landing point, if you will, for this whole discussion of survival of consciousness. And we'll get back to talking about the book and survival of consciousness, but I want to follow this line that you're on also because it's fascinating to me and we don't get a chance to talk about it enough. And that's that while I share your concern and the issues that you raise are obviously uh, pressing and, and obvious to all of us. But at the same time, I can't help but feel that there's, there's another way of looking at survival that turns all those issues on its head, right? Because one of the natural conclusions from the understanding that the best evidence suggests the survival of consciousness is real is that it gets us out of this time-limited sense that we live in, in this pressing need to kind of fix things now and that time is marching and that evolution is here and this kind of treadmill that we're on, doesn't it? Because now we're talking about consciousness really being infinite. And with reincarnation, there's really no way to logically conclude that we're headed towards anywhere other than just further evolution and wherever that gets to. So isn't that a, a, another natural conclusion that one can draw from this whole understanding of consciousness being unlimited in terms of time? I mean, we have all the time in the world, don't we? 
I, I agree with you in a sense. Um, <laughs> I do think that uh, reclaiming the widespread belief in an afterlife, which is something that people did have, you know, perhaps four, three, four, five hundred years ago, um, would, would result in many practical benefits. And uh, the philosopher um, David Griffin and I uh, agree that belief in an afterlife confers several practical benefits, such as, for example, such a belief may help overcome the fear of death. Uh, if people are convinced they are not ultimately subject to any earthly power, this can increase their courage to fight for freedom, ecologically sustainable policies, and social justice. And if people believe that this life is not the final word, and that justice will prevail in the next life, this can help them withstand the unfairness they encounter in the here and now. And the idea of a life, of life as an unfolding journey, which continues even after death, can lead to a greater sense of connection with the universe as it unfolds into the future. And finally, the belief in life after death can help counter this extreme degree of materialism that has pervaded every niche of modern civilization, and which I think, which many people think, is behind um, a great deal of our, sh our sh most short-sighted and destructive policies. I hear you. I hear you. I rail against that kind of stuff all the time, and... You are also someone who is uh, known to rail against those same things and rail against this fundamental materialist, dogmatic, pseudo-skeptic culture that we have. And I get all that. But let me play devil's advocate for a minute and talk about social cohesion. And I wanted to go off and take a little sidetrack with you for a minute and look at like the vaccine controversy. Remember that guy, David Wakefield, who said, hey, you know, he's a doctor in the UK. He's a pediatric uh, gastromedy guy, I think, you know, the stomach guy for, for kids. And he has a bunch of parents coming to him and saying, hey, my kids have autism and gosh darn it i know it's tr it's directly tied to these vaccines because we went and got the vaccines and boom then it happened so he, he's just a doctor presented with patients who have a problem he starts looking into this and he says hey i think there's something to this and he starts putting it together and wow he gets slammed right i mean this guy this guy can no longer practice medicine he's slammed and Maybe he was right. I mean, maybe we shouldn't pump kids with nine different vaccines when we've never tested the interaction of these vaccines together. Maybe he was right. But at the same time, didn't we need to put this guy down? Didn't we need to destroy Wakefield? Didn't we have to protect the herd? We can't have everyone running out and saying they're not going to vaccinate their kids. So maybe in the same way, when we hear folks like Richard Wiseman say, you know, hey, by any other standards, Psy is proven, and he could just as easily say, by, by the normal standards of, of any other area of science, survival of consciousness is proven. He could say the same thing. But then he says, but we still shouldn't believe it. Maybe what he's really saying is, we got to protect the herd. We got to keep this thing going. So when guys like you, smart guys like you, and I guess me, say, hey, we need to end all this materialistic nonsense, where are we taking people? Where, where, would, where would we head if we, if we didn't have this system? You're right. Well, uh, I'm not going to sit here and endorse the stupidity of the bovine mentality, um, the herd mentality. Uh, the Indians used to drive herds of buffalo off of cliffs because they knew if they got the herd moving, uh, the first ones would jump off the cliff because the others behind them were pushing them and the rest would simply follow the rest of the herd. So I'm no, uh, I have no admiration for the herd mentality. Um, with regards to Shermer, I don't think his motivation is to protect the herd. I think his motivation is to promote his career. Right, and, and, I, and I hear you. Okay, so bison over the cliff is, is a great story, and it's true. But there's another story, too. The other story is the Huns over the hill, right? So we all get real lovey-dovey and start feeling all this. We're all connected, and we're all good, and all this stuff that you guys in the, are, are peddling. And then the Huns come over the hill, and they 
kill every man, woman, and child because they believe their God told them they were supposed to rule the world. Or, or, or number two, the other thing is that the church gets all the power now, because what you're really heading towards is some kind of spiritual understanding. We know where that goes. It's another power grab by the, the bishops or the priests or whoever they want to call themselves. They grab all the power, and then they start building these nice little bonfires and putting people on them because they don't think they're the right ones. I mean, let's kind of go there for a little bit, Chris, and not just talk about, gee, we want change and we want this. Let's talk about where that change could really lead. These are realistic unintended consequences of survival of consciousness becoming kind of the mainstream belief system. Well, in my book that I wrote, uh, let's just see here. I wrote, the experiences described in the pages that follow have important implications for for humanity. Based upon my own experience and that of many others, I sincerely believe that deeply beneficial changes in our view of the universe and our place within it will be gained by those who read about these strange and often wonderful experiences and then they then take their profound lessons to heart. Then I add, most people base their beliefs regarding the afterlife on religious or materialistic faith. But there is a third alternative one that requires neither a leap of faith nor the denial of evidence. So when you're talking about um, some of the crimes that uh, were occasionally committed by organized religion during the uh, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, yes, those crimes were real. And those crimes led to a backlash known as the Enlightenment in which certain philosophers, not so much scientists, but philosophers such as Voltaire and Diderot and later in the 18th century Aldous Huxley, 19th century Aldous Huxley and others, and today in the work of uh, uh, Richard Dawkins and uh, other militant atheists, their work is essentially a backlash against the excesses of irrational religious belief and religious extremism. What they've gone they, however, have gone to the other extreme. They've embraced the doctrine of crude materialism, which they think is implied by science, which is, is really not. It's implied by science, which has been long, long obsolete. But their, athe- their militant atheism is based upon this doctrine of materialism, and they are going to do everything they possibly can in order to deny or discredit any evidence that falsifies the doctrine of materialism. Agreed. But are there unintended consequences for overthrowing materialism? I just want to run that speculation with you, Chris, because we're both of the same belief in terms of how completely idiotic that is, in terms of trying to support that with any real science, any real evidence. But is there a chance that, you know what, the, the, the game is going to wind up being played one way or another. It's going to be wind up being played with scientific materialism or it's going to be wind up being played with church rule. And what, what someone has made the decision that at the end of the day, I choose the, scien- the phony scientific materialism over the thin, phony church state. I think that's a false dichotomy. I don't think that's the choice. One of the uh, major themes of my book is that there's a third alternative, one that does not require a leap of faith and one that does not require embracing the pseudoscientific ideology of materialism. There's a third alternative, and the third alternative is to examine the evidence without prejudice, without materialistic prejudice or religious prejudice, and see what the evidence says. And I believe that the conclusions that the evidence implies are not dogmatic. They do not ask people to go out and burn those who disagree with us at the stake or to wage war against those who disagree with us or, to, or on the other hand, to deny or suppress evidence. I think there's a third alternative. And uh, I'd like to read something from my book here where I, dis- I briefly discuss that. And it's in chapter one, I believe, and I say that... Uh, The deniers and debunkers tend to be militant atheists who are motivated by allegiance to an obsolete worldview, by ignorance of the implications of the new physics, and by a hatred of religion and superstition. If they admitted to the reality of psychic abilities such as telepathy, and of the near-death experience as involving a genuine separation of mind from body, 
then the materialistic foundation of their worldview would crumble. The deniers fear that the demise of materialism would usher in a return to an age of, of religious persecution and irrationality. This fear is evident in the apocalyptic strain of some of the committee, the Committee for Scientific Investigation, writing, for instance, the announcement of the founding of the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of the Claims of the Paranormal stated, and I quote, Perhaps we ought not to assume that the scientific enlightenment will continue indefinitely. Like the Hellenic civilization, it may be overwhelmed by irrationalism, subjectivism, and obscurant obscurantism. And then I go, I go on to say, but these fears seem to be absolutely groundless. As mentioned above, surveys show that most scientists accept the likely existence of psychic abilities. Among the general public, belief in the reality of psi phenomena is widespread. But polls have also shown that over 90% of the public regard scientists as having considerable or even very great prestige. And many of the leading near-death experience researchers are respected cardiologists and neuroscientists. And so I conclude, society is unlikely to return to the dark ages because of widespread interest in psychic phenomena and in the near-death experience. Okay. And Chris, I have to say, you do build a very, very strong case in the book. And anyone who's familiar with your previous books will appreciate the level of depth you go into and the extent of you, the evidence, and it's all very well documented, and the way you put it together, I think is very, very convincing. Let's talk a little bit about the skeptical arguments against survival, because you also address those in the book. You jump over on the other side and say, hey, here's my best argument against the skeptical arguments, and you spend some time talking about the materialistic arguments, but you really make pretty quick work of a lot of that, because it's mostly nonsense, and there's, there's the argument that there isn't any evidence and that it's all fraud and you just kind of handle it. So you say, hey, there's a ton of evidence and here it is. And you say with regard to fraud, you know, there's always going to be isolated instances of fraud, but it's not reasonable to think that that's going to account for very much of the best evidence that you put forward in the book. But you spend a lot more time talking about the super psi explanation or as you call it in the book, the super ESP hypothesis as a possible explanation for this survival of consciousness. Explain to us, maybe start by what is super ESP and then why you think it doesn't hold up. Okay. Um, well, let's treat this in a sort of historical manner to see um, just how the super ESP explanation came to be proposed for as long as there have been human beings and for all we know perhaps even longer there seems to have been evidence suggesting that human beings and perhaps other living things survive the deaths of their bodies I mean we had the Neanderthals they buried their dead with flowers and jewelry and utensils presumably for use in their next life so all through human civilization we've had people believing that they will survive the deaths of their bodies. And many, many people uh, simply accepted it as a matter of course. It wasn't questioned. So the, why did they believe this? Well, every indication seems to be that in all societies past and present, people have experienced certain phenomena that would lead them to believe in survival. I'm talking about things like... Um, near-death experiences, deathbed visions, people who report seeing deceased relatives coming to take them away just before they die, um, children who remember previous lives, in other words, evidence for reincarnation, um, apparitions, which have been reported from all societies of which we have record, and communication with the dead, which also seems to have been, been uh, found in virtually all societies of which we have record. So the obvious inference from this data was that we survive the deaths of our bodies and that sometimes those who have gone before us can return and communicate. Now, later on, these beliefs were hardened into various dogmas 
with the rise of agriculture came the rise of organized religion and priestly castes and, uh, of course, layers of dogma were added to the ancient beliefs in accordance with the conditions of the various societies. So some societies had peaceful religions, some societies had warlike religions, and so forth. But they all had various priestly castes. This did lead, of course, in some places, but particularly the West, with its fragmented geography, um, into various religious schisms, which sometimes settled their differences violently. And then you had the scientific revolution, due to people like Kepler, Galileo, and Newton. Now, Newton put forward a theory of physics, which was very mechanistic and mechanical. The universe was now seen as a gigantic clockwork mechanism. Uh, and now Newton himself was a religious man. He thought that the planets were originally hurled by the hand of God, and he thought that he thought that human beings were the sole exception in an otherwise deterministic, mechanistic universe. But his followers, philosophers such as Voltaire, Diderot, and so forth, they wanted to attack the authority of the church. The horrors of religious wars were fresh in their minds. And so they used Newtonian physics to, do, to support the ancient philosophy of materialism which essentially says that all that matters is matter, and the mind is at most a useless epiphenomena, a byproduct produced by the brain. And so, therefore, minds have no causal role in nature, the universe is causally closed, and uh, we should not believe in superstitious things or in um, organized religion. Then, of course, Darwin came along and uh, with his theory of natural selection based upon... Um, natural selection operating upon random variation in order to produce... You mean Alf Alfred Russell Wallace came along, right? Darwin and Wallace discovered or invented the theory, his, their theory of evolution by natural selection at, at just about the same time. Wallace probably came up with it first. It's hard to say. And then they, they, Darwin basically panicked and decided to publish his book. Um, so anyway, this was a further nail in the coffin of, uh, well... <laughs> It was, it was further, further ammunition for the militant atheists. And so, in response, um, the British and American Society of Psychical Research were formed, in, first in England, later on in Boston. And they were horrified by the materialism, which was helping to sweep away uh, spiritual beliefs. And so, they wanted to take on the materialists of their own game. They want to find scientific evidence for survival. And so they did. They found evidence for survival from apparitions uh, um, and from communication through mediums. So then they seem to have good evidence, good experimental evidence that in favor of survival. The hypothesis that extrasensory perception could be used to... Um, explain these mediumistic communications was put forward. It was perhaps the mediums are very gifted in terms of extrasensory perception, in terms of telepathy and clairvoyance, and they're simply reading the minds of the sitters in order to convince, uh, convey messages that seem to be from the deceased, but are actually from the minds of the sitters. Right. So that's, that's your super ESP hypothesis, right? No, no, not yet. That's only that's the ordinary ESP. Yeah, hypothesis. yeah, that's the ordinary ESP. Okay. So what happened then was an experiment was proposed, the so-called proxy sittings, and that's where one person sits with the medium on behalf of a third person who is not present, and the person who sits with the medium is told nothing more than than uh, the deceased person's name and date of death. So they don't know the person. They know nothing about the person except for that. They go see the medium on behalf of that person and the so-called proxy sittings, and then see if you get results and see if the results are as good as if the person was there. And what they found is that the proxy sittings gave, gave results every bit as good as if the, uh, the sitter who knew the person was there. So this conclusively proved false, the idea that the medium was either fishing for information, in other words, looking for visual cues and following up on visual cues and so forth. And, and Chris, remind everyone what time frame we're talking about here and who are some of the key players, both mediums and scientists who are investigating and really scrutinizing very carefully 
these mediums for any kind of fraud or impropriety? Throw out some names. Well, the British and American Society of Psychical Research were really in full swing from about the year 1800 to about the years, I don't know, 1935, 1940. That was the heyday of psychical research into these things. And some of the people were, oh, the physicists are all over the lodge. Um, Who at the time was one of the most respected intellectuals and scientists of his day, right? That's absolutely right. And there were various, uh, let's see, who else was there? Um, Sir Oliver Lodge, uh, Henry Sidgwick, the Cambridge philosopher, um, Frederick Myers, a a scholar of classics at Cambridge, uh, Mr. Hodgson, and several others. William James in the United States. So there were some of the very best intellectuals of the time, scientists, philosophers, um, statesmen. Yeah. So anyway, the, the uh, proxy sittings were invented. And um, so it ruled, out, it ruled out fishing, where the medium fishes for information based upon various clues. You know, they, say, they might say, well, I see a man with dark hair. And if the person goes, hmm, and they go, oh, yes, yes, he's a man with dark hair. I see a woman with blonde hair. No, no, no. Okay, let's forget that. That's, that's the technique of fishing. So proxy sittings effectively ruled out fishing for information, and they also ruled out telepathy between the medium and the sitter because the sitter didn't know any, any of this information. Yet correct information was conveyed again and again, just as good as if uh, the sitter had known the person in question. So what happened was that this was, since the proxy sittings ruled out telepathy between medium and sitter, the extrasensory perception hypothesis of communication was extended further and further and further in order to cover proxy cases, uh, in order to cover the so-called drop-in cases where somebody drops in, um, and unknown to the medium, unknown to the sitter, yet also... Uh, um, provides information that later turns out to be correct. So give us an example of how this ever-expanding hypothesis gets spun out there. I mean, well, how do they say it? It's supposed to work with a degree that's seldom, if ever, seen apart from such cases of communication with the alleged deceased in question. Uh, if you look at if you look at uh, extrasensory examples of telepathy and clairvoyance in real life, they're very low-level sorts of events. Telepathy is Latin for distant feeling. Tele meaning distance, pathy meaning feeling, as in sympathy and empathy. So telepathy literally means distant feeling. Clairvoyance means clear vision. And in real life, these sorts of abilities almost always work between people who have some sort of close emotional connection. In the proxy sittings, these people had no close emotional connection, yet extrasensory perception was said to exist uh, just as good as as ever, with no reduction in ability. The theory of super ESP takes the theory of extrasensory perception and it postulates that the medium mind, the medium, the mind of the medium has these supernormal abilities to access information anywhere any time, regardless of, from the minds of people, regardless of what those people are thinking, regardless of what those people might be doing. Unlimited ability to access the minds from books, which are at unknown locations, on topics of no interest to the, to the medium. Uh, and then it's extended even further to assume that it can then dress up this information from the perspective of the deceased person in question. And it gets even worse than that. The problem with Super ESP is it's, it's continually, continually extended to cover each new case, which cannot be explained on the basis of ordinary extrasensory perception. Chris, let's talk a little bit about proof. At the end of the book, you conclude by saying that there are three levels of proof, proof beyond all doubt, proof beyond all reasonable doubt, and preponderance of evidence, overcoming the preponderance of evidence, or accepting the preponderance of evidence. Tell us where you fall in that scale regarding the belief that consciousness survives bodily death. In that chapter, I have a section titled Theory of Knowledge, 
which I first define knowledge. And I would define knowledge as a belief that meets the following three criteria. First of all, it is justified by a critical evaluation of the evidence. And so, therefore, we have no good reason to think it is true. I'm sorry, we have good reason to think it is true. And furthermore, we have no good reason to think it may not be true. Um, so, for instance, consider my belief that I have only one brother. I believe this to be true because I was raised alongside him and I never saw my parents bring home and raise another boy. I therefore have good reason to consider this belief true. Furthermore, I have never heard any rumors about my mother giving up a boy for adoption before I was born, and nor has anyone, bearing a family resemblance or not, ever approached me claiming to be my long-lost brother. I therefore have no good reason, or any reason for that matter, to suspect that my belief may not be true. Now, could I possibly be mistaken in my belief? Of course. But my point is that I have no good reason to think that my I have good reason to think that my belief is correct, and no good reason whatsoever to think it may be false. I therefore consider my belief that I have only one brother to be an item of knowledge. In other words, I consider it to be a fact. So knowledge is a category of belief. Um, it's those beliefs we have good reason to think are true, and no good reason to think may be false. And so I consider a fact to be an item of knowledge. And uh, after a fairly long discussion, which I really can't do justice in a brief phone call, I do conclude that, uh, as others before me have concluded, survival of consciousness past the point of biological death is a fact. A fact, and what you say in the book is that it's proven to you beyond all reasonable doubt. And that's, I think, great. It's great that you come out and are that bold to say that, because as you know, most folks who we expect to be proponents usually fall into that, well, you know, the preponderance of the evidence overwhelmingly suggests, but they won't go and say, hey, beyond reasonable doubt, this is it, and 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 you kind of push it to that, that next level. What, is that, what does that mean for you? Why, why is it important to go there and say, hey, this is really the way it is? It's beyond all reasonable doubt, you survive your bodily death. Why is it important? Hmm. What, because, I mean, let's, let's be real, right? I mean, most, to take NDE researchers, when you really dig into these NDE researchers, you can tell that's what they believe, right? But very, very few of them say it that way. They always just kind of backpedal a little bit, play it safe with the party line, if you will, that, hey, the evidence, it's all up in the air, but it seems to be leaning this way. And I understand you're not a, an, an academic in an institution that requires you to kind of hold any party line, but you do understand that your position is pretty bold, right? Yes, it is. I also think that, I, I think that uh, it's an important statement to make. As I said before, at the beginning of this conversation, I think that if more people um, recognized that survival is a fact, they would, first of all, I think it would bring a lot more happiness to their lives. It would bring them a lot more um, optimism and uh, it would reduce cynicism. I think it would reduce uh, anger and vindictiveness, bitterness, and I think it would lead people to lead better lives. But are there a lot of steps in between there, Chris? I mean, that's the one thing, I guess, that I took away from this. And I'm on a similar journey that you are on in terms of this information, this data, this knowledge. I think it can be personally transformative. I have not had a near-death experience. I haven't had any profound spiritual transformational experiences. I've had an experience of transformation via the data via the, the experiences of others, that the, the people that I respect that I think have done a fair job of trying to sort this thing out and said, hey, this is where the truth seems to lie. So I'm with you on all that. But I have to tell you, the people that I encounter in my day-to-day -day life, one, they're not usually persuaded to change their beliefs by data alone. I don't know why. I mean, I'm kind of wired that way. But I found that a lot of people don't seem to be wired that way. But number two, what seems to get in the way for people are a lot of the steps in between 
okay, that's what the data says. And on the other hand, therefore, this is how I should live my life. I mean, there's a lot of questions there. There's a thousand questions between me accepting that survival of consciousness is real and then me incorporating that into my life. Do we live in a, you know, Carl Sagan wrote a book many years ago, uh, Demon Haunted World. Hey, do we live in a demon haunted world? Science has rescued us from that demon haunted world. Do you want to send us back to it? Is the world demon haunted? I mean, these are the kind of questions that I think spring to mind for people when they're faced with the idea that consciousness survives death, but they're not filled in with all the answers to all the questions that that stirs up. What do you think? Well, as I said before, I think that my book shows there's a third alternative between blind religious faith and pseudoscientific doctrine of materialism. But that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay, so I I accept your third rail. I'm all over it. I hear the data. Consciousness survives death. Huge implications for me now. What what does that mean? What what does that mean about? Is it a demon haunted world? Do I have to be afraid of of spirits? What does this mean in terms of survival? How long do I survive? How many lives do I live? Do I go to heaven? There are a thousand questions that immediately spring to mind. That are the real questions that people have. You know, we play this little skeptic believer science versus religion stuff, and that just gets played out in this cartoonish way. But the what people are really worried about are the, the personal questions that lie underneath that. So you've done a fine job in your book of equipping people with the information they need to kind of approach that first question that, okay, I can, as a reasonable person, accept that consciousness survives death. Bravo. Hooray. But right beneath that are the really important questions. And what are people supposed to do about those questions? I mean, it's, it's not just a matter of, oh, consciousness survives death, so let's save the planet and, and recycle. <laughs> those aren't the questions that people yeah, of, have. Of course, why they not? Have deeper but questions. That's why I wrote the final section of my book. The final section of my book is titled, What the Dead Say. So once I've convinced people that the dead are, have in fact survived and are indeed communicating through gifted human mediums, then I discuss what they say. And it's really those messages, I suppose, which are sources of wisdom and optimism. And uh, I don't think there's anything that, anything particularly horrific in there. There's nothing about eternal hellfire. It does, the, the dead do say that uh, the old saying, what we, 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 sh- we shall sow as we reap, that has truth to it. But they also say there's no eternal hellfire. Um, they talk about a gradual process of development on, on the other side. Uh, many of us will return to this earth to reincarnate. And they say that this does not happen 50, 100, 1,000 times. The average human being, according to the deceased communicators, only reincarnates two, three, perhaps four times at most. So if people have questions like that, all they they need to do is simply read the very last section of my book. You know, I'm kind of with you on that, Chris, but as you know, those accounts are they vary tremendously. I don't think so. And I don't think so. I find, I, I find enormous similarities between the different accounts. And I, I explicitly point them out. Well, you know, we've talked to folks on this show that have uh, all, all sorts of varying ideas about that. People who are both mediumistic, people who channel, people who do all, all sorts of kind of things. And you can also look over in the near-death experience literature, which also – gives these accounts of, uh, direct accounts of, I mean, go to nderf.org, Jeff Long's website, where he's compiled 2,000 of those accounts, and they vary tremendously. I mean, you'll hear very uh, religiously oriented, I met Jesus and he said this, versus you'll hear all sorts of different accounts. So don't we really have to be a little bit careful when we start doing content analysis there and saying we can really pull it apart and this is what it indicates. I, don't, I just don't think that's the case. I can't comment on Long's, Long's work. There are, I have a, a, 
a whole section called Near-Death Experiences Across Cultures in my second book, Science and the Near-Death Experience. And I analyze accounts, near-death experience accounts from various cultures, China, India, Maori, New Zealand, various other, the uh, um, North American Aboriginals. And what I found is that journeys to other worlds, out-of-body experiences, and encounters with the deceased and otherworldly figures seem to be the most universal features of the near-death experience. Borders of some sort are, are also found in accounts from different cultures. But tunnel and life review experiences seem to be mostly confined to the West. So I disagree that near-death experiences are vast and varied. No two are exactly the like. But myself and other researchers have found very great similarities between the near-death experience. Well, I think you're taking what I said in the wrong way. I mean, the skeptical argument that they're vast and varied, no, I'm not going there. I mean, I'm very much uh, a believer that near-death experience accounts bring us closer to a deeper understanding of part of what happens in this journey beyond our physical death. So th th I'm not going there. But I do think, and I think many people would agree with me, I've, I've had the leading near-death experience researchers on the show, and they've agreed that there really isn't a good explanation for some of the variety. Sure, we can, we can look for the similar patterns, and those are important. And they're certainly important when you're debating or arguing against a, a skeptic who says, gee, we can't, we have to throw out all these accounts because they're all over the board. No, that's not the case. But if we really try and do a content analysis, I think a lot of near-death experience researchers will agree that they're, they're just, they're challenging material. It, it can be all over the board. And the same thing with uh, mediumistic readings. I mean, they can just be, they can be very challenging in terms of figuring all that out. But you know what? I'm glad you addressed it in that section of the book, and maybe that's where someone has to take over and take their own personal interpretation of the material and decide how they're going to take it forward. So let's do this. In the little bit of time that we have left, let's talk about where you go from here, because this is kind of an important wrap-up for you. I mean, this was a, a trilogy of books um, and a fantastic three book set that you put together. Um, where do you go from here with this, Chris? I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. Um, we've, we've, uh, I wrote an article in the Journal of Near-Death Studies in response to an article written by a skeptical uh, anesthesiologist named Gerald Worley, and he attempted to debunk the famous Pam Reynolds near-death experience, which occurred while she was um, clinically dead basically. Uh, briefly, they had to operate, remove an aneurysm from her brain stem, and to do so, they had to clinically kill her. They had to stop her heart, they had to drain all the blood from her body, and then uh, remove the aneurysm from the base of her brain. And during this experience, she had one of the deepest near-death experiences ever recorded, showing many of the classic features found in most near-death experiences from around the world, such as, for instance, feelings of peace, uh, out-of-body experience, travel to an otherworldly realm, and meeting with deceased relatives. Now, some people say near-death experiences are all over the map. No, the best ones, and most of them, include those three core elements, including those experiences found in different cultures. I don't care where you're looking. You look in Guam, you can look in Maori, New Zealand, uh, American Aboriginals, wherever. Those core experiences will be found in near-death experiences. Any, any, disagree, any um, idiosyncrasies will be found, yes, but they're usually trivial. But, but Chris, why, why do we want to go there? I mean, why do we want to say something like that? that? That seems to suggest that we understand what's going on, what realm they're going to, what dimension they're going to. I, broaden it. You know, I, I just had Evan Alexander on the show, uh, I don't know, a month or so ago. Former Harvard neurosurgeon who had this dramatic near-death experience very transformative for him. But wh where he's going with the, with the work is to look broadly at spiritually transformative experiences, right? So somebody has a Kundalini experience, or somebody just has a spontaneous 
experience walking through the street. You can find scores of these people in mental institutions because that's where they wind up. They've really had a real awakening, a spiritual awakening that we don't fully understand, and yet they wind up in mental institutions. But that's another story for another time. But I think when we start going down that path and saying, these are definitely the core experiences of the best experience, we don't know what the heck we're talking about. We're, we, we don't know what that means. We don't know. I'm, I'm t- tomorrow, I'm scheduled to have an interview with uh, Robert Bruce, one of the best known out of body experience travelers, astral travelers in the world. He's been at it for 30 years. He's going to tell me a, a very uh, a detailed uh, topography of the spirit world and all these different dimensions that he's traveled to, both higher and lower. Now, I don't know how much of that is true, but that's certainly his experience, and he has uh, scores of people that will back him up on that. Uh, what I say is, we just don't know. We, we cross the chasm from this ridiculous materialism that we're in. But then we have to be really careful because when we do cross that chasm, a lot of the things that we try and say aren't going to make a lot of sense. We can't take this same scientific precision and bring it to that other dimension. It just doesn't fit. I agree with that. But my point is, is that I have read a great deal of accounts describing the so-called afterworld, and what I find is a great deal of similarity. And I also find that the deepest accounts explain discrepancies between the other accounts, in other words, the people who have been there the longest. Uh, So I don't find that the reports are all all over the map, but then again, I I don't read or listen to every single, shall we say, New Age account or wild claim that is presented out there. I go only for what I consider to be the best or most reliable, most well-documented reports. And I find a great deal of similarity in my reports, and I discuss this similarity in my book, Science and the Afterlife Experience. I I hear you, Chris. I just think, you know, when you start saying we only reincarnate two or three times, man, we have have no clue. No clue. I didn't say, I didn't say, I personally think we only reincarnate two or three times. I said that 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 was a claim made by one of the communicators whom I regard as being the most trustworthy of the communicators, Frederick Myers, who established his identity over about 20, 30 years through the famed cross correspondences, which uh, convinced a great number of his friends and colleagues that it really was him communicating through mediums in various parts of the world, mediums who did not know each other. So after, about 20, 25 years after, he had gone through this extensive period of the, launching these cross, cross-correspondences, which are essentially literary puzzles, he then sat down and dictated through two, in two books, through the medium Geraldine Cummins, his account of, of his experiences in the afterworld and what he had learned. I consider that account to be um, one of the best. Fair enough. Chris, I think I kind of got you sidetracked. You were about to tell us a little bit more about where you think you might be heading, and you were talking about your confrontation with Gerald Worley. Uh, What is coming up for you? Possibly some film projects. The first one may involve a uh, challenge that I threw out to Gerald Worley. He said that the famous Pam Reynolds case could be explained in terms of uh, some lingering sense of consciousness and some anesthesia-induced fantasy and this sort of thing. And I basically tore his arguments apart, and then I challenged him. I said, Gerald, at the end of my article, I said, Gerald, let's go to the Barrow Institute the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona, and let's do this experiment. You and me will be prepared just as Pam was prepared before our operation, um, and we'll see. We'll see if we can really hear people talking in the room, if we can really describe what's going on in the room, and if we can really hear the song Hotel California. Fascinating. Now, that would be an experiment that I would tune in to watch. I hope we get that on my uh, local cable network. Chris, uh, we're running out of time. It's been great to have you on. Wish you the very best of luck with the book that is out now and everyone can get on, on Amazon. Again, the title is Science and the Afterlife Experience. Again, Chris, thanks so much for joining me on Skeptico. 
Thanks, Alex. If your listeners are interested, they can actually go to the book's website, and it's the same as the book. It's www.scienceandtheafterlifeexperience.com, and they can read excerpts and uh, endorsements and so forth. Great. By the way, a ton of fabulous endorsements. Uh, I think that speaks volumes for the, the progress you've made and the respect that you've earned in this field. You obviously have a lot of supporters uh, well earned and uh, and best of luck with your future endeavors, whatever they might be. Thanks, Alex. Thanks again to Chris Carter for joining me today on Skeptico. So I have a couple of questions to tee up from this interview, but before I get there, I wanted to make sure that you know that I really don't think it's okay that the medical community ostracized Andrew Wakefield for merely pointing out that there may be some health risks associated with vaccines. But I do think it's important to have something more than an eyes-wide-shut worldview on how medicine, and for that matter, science really operates. And I guess, well, we spend quite a bit of time talking about that on this show. So you probably already know my point of view on that. Hey, a couple questions from the show. The first would be the most obvious. Has Chris done it? Has he effectively made his case for an afterlife? Is there survival of consciousness? Not Super Psy or any of the rest of that baloney. Does your individual consciousness survive you after your body dies? And question two is what I guess I was poking at Chris about, and that's, are there consequences? Maybe consequences that we're not fully willing to accept for accepting this idea that consciousness does survive death. So is this a forced choice, bad bargain, between materialistic science and state-sponsored religion, even though we'd like there to be this third alternative of enlightened beings following their higher purpose? Should we really have any confidence that things can really work out that way? Or does history teach us a lesson that we really have to choose between some variation of those two options. Anyways, kick that around a little bit. Let me know your thoughts. The place to do that, of course, is the Skeptico website at S-K-E-P-T-I-K-O. Don't forget the K in there, dot com. And there, of course, you'll find links to all our previous shows, email, Facebook link to me, as well as the comment section and a link over to the forum section of the website. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you tell your friends about this interview with Chris Carter and point them to not only the interview, but to his excellent book. I have a number of interesting shows coming up, working on them as we speak, kind of one in the hopper being edited and another interview being done today. So I want you to know I'm busy cranking these things out, love doing it, and love hearing from you as you listen to them. So that's going to do it for this time. Until next time, take care. Bye for now. 